Okay, so uh, good morning everyone. Welcome to the Research Thinkages series of the UP College of Music. This is a Metro Manila Commission professorial lecture and our speaker today will be talking about um, vaudeville music in the rise of American Empire. First, let me remind you that you are live on YouTube and please mute your video and audio uh, questions will be posted later in the chat box and also the YouTube channel also has provision for you to write your, uh, your questions. Okay, let me introduce our speaker for today. He is an associate professor at the Department of Musicology at the University of the Philippines College of Music, Diliman. Uh, he is the editor of uh, Sai Sai Himig, a source book on Philippine music history and he curated its accompanying three CD recordings. Um, his dissertation, Music, Labor, and Capitalism in Manila's Transforming Colonial Society in the late 19th century was accorded second honorary mention in the International Musicological Society Outstanding Dissertation Award for this year, 2020. Uh, he was consultant and contributor to the second edition of uh, the music volume of the Cultural Center of the Philippines or CCP Encyclopedia of Philippine Arts. He has written articles and reviews for the Humanities Diliman, Musica Journal, Saliksik E Journal, Malaysian Journal of Music, Perspective in the Arts and Humanities, International Journal of Asian Studies and Asian Studies. He also performs as a conductor of the fourth time Ani Nang Dangal Awardee, the Novo Concertante Manila, currently ranked third in the top 1,000 mixed squares of the world by Interkultur Germany. Okay, everyone, let's welcome our speaker, Dr. Arvin Tan. Thank you very much, Ma'am Christine. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank the Metro Manila Commission for uh, giving this grant to me and also to uh, Dean uh, Vern de la Peña, who uh, recommended me for this grant. And of course, my advisor, Dr. Jose S. Buenconsejo. Uh, thank you very much. Now I will share my screen and we begin the discussion. <laughs> All right. What the film music in rise of American empire. On April 10, 8, 1980, the Philippine Educational Theater Association, also known as PETA, premiered Canoplin, an improvisation on the life and performances of a Filipino comedian a play written by Mani Pambid about the life of one of Manila's most popular vaudeville superstars during the American colonial period. The play chronicles the success and popularity of Canuto Francia, also known as Canoplin, when vaudeville reigned as the most prolific public entertainment form in the islands in the 1920s and the eventual collapse of his stardom after the Second World War. As a young boy, Canuto's impoverished origins from the poor region of Tondo in Manila compelled him to find any work in order to bring food to their family's dining table. He worked as an errand boy to the owner of Banda Aguila, and the eventual death of his mother when Canuto was 11 years old worsened his destitute situation, which forced him to work as a shoeshine, bro shoeshine boy. To bring joy into his desolate childhood, he saved a few centavos occasionally so he could sneak inside movie houses to watch his favorite American film star, Charlie Chaplin, whose moves he imitated. Donning a Chaplin-like suit, he joined and won the competition for the most imaginative costume at the annual Manila Carnival in the late 1910s, which opened the opportunity for him to work at the circus. Initially working as a circus barker, Canuto learned a few magic tricks from Blas Angeles, the carnival's master magician, and became Angeles' assistant. Eventually, he met Luis Borromeo, also known as Borromeo Lu, a returning Filipino performer in 1921 who spent five years in the USA and Canada traveling with the Keith and Orpheum Vaudeville Corporation who invited him to join his vaudeville circuit and named him Canoplin, Chaplin of the Philippine Islands. As such, he mimicked Charlie Chaplin, and in addition, 
He performed magic tricks that made him one of the most bankable stars of the Philippine vaudeville scene. His famed act featured him as a pathetic clown, a magician whose tricks frequently failed or were revealed to the audience. As a vaudeville superstar, Panoplin earned 125 pesos when others were paid only seven pesos a week and enjoyed perks such as a designated dressing room only for himself when all the rest of the cast shared an entire backstage. In Manila, he was constantly featured in the major show houses of the capital, the newly built Metropolitan Opera House, Cine Rizal, and Teatro Zorilla, among others. <clears throat> During the war years from 1942 to 1945, the Japanese encouraged vaudeville productions, but Canoplin was among those who chose to stay away and moved his family to the fields of Malolos. After the Second World War, the rising prominence of films obligated Canoplin to migrate to the new art form, and he appeared in and directed a few movies, but the frequency of his performances were limited, which did not match his earlier popularity as a vaudeville superstar in the 1920s and 1930s. In his attempt to revive his career as a vaudevillista or vaudevillian, he continued to perform his signature acts and change from his pre-war exhibitions in the struggling vaudeville theaters after the war. However, these did not receive a similar appreciation by the new generation of theater audiences whose taste for entertainment had changed to the new media technologies, particularly of sound movie. In addition, audiences preferred newer imitations of younger American singers, such as Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra, Perry Como, and Johnny James's, who were featured in the new marker of a modern household, the television. Canoplin mastered his imitation of Charlie Chaplin, and his popularity lasted only as long as that of Hollywood's Trump. In the play, these poignant words uttered by the character of Canoplin provide us with a glimpse of this particular vaudevillista's valuation of his work as an entertainer and acceptance of his career's impending end. I quote, the limits of what I knew, the limits of my talent, limits of my strength, limits of what I was capable of. It is all I know, it is all I can do to mimic. But the public accepted it. They embraced me. They laughed when I performed. They enjoyed my impersonations. And I was able to get by because of them. We lived like royalty, but they didn't just give me money. They showered me with their awe, with their applause. Now I'm old. I've slowed down. And like what you said, nobody cares about me anymore. I'm a has been. End of quote from uh, Pambid, uh, translated by So. The story of Kanuplin is a nostalgic remembrance of the glorious days of vaudeville productions when they enlivened the popular entertainment scene of Manila at the time when Filipinos, I quote, greeted with open arms the invasion of American products and uh, the American way of life. End of quote. The 1920s was also a period when the effects of capitalism introduced in the late 19th century under the Spanish colonial government have transformed the social, cultural, economic, and political conditions of the islands. The burgeoning middle class of the late 19th century expanded to include Western, which are mostly American educated Filipinos who were eventually employed in the colonial bureaucracies of the American insular government. This new social group appropriated a cosmopolitan orientation and a modern consumer lifestyle. And that, that reflected their taste for what was American, such as wearing flannel scarf, uh, silk shirt, white bell bottoms, speaking in slang, dancing the Charleston, watching vaudeville, attending the carnival, among others, which reflected modernity and progress. As Filipino historian Rasil Mojares argues, and I quote, contact with America nourished an appetite for urbanity and cosmopolitanism, end of quote. 
Kanuflin's life story demonstrates how the popular music industry capitalized on the marketability of stars who were considered as popularizers of American culture, mimicking successful American superstars following the belief, and I quote, that they could not make it unless they were copies of an American original, end of quote from Fernandez. Following Timothy Taylor's assertion that in the 1920s, capitalism in the realm of cultural production has thrived on stars and in their emphasis on blockbusters, cultural industries have thus become increasingly like the manufacturer of any other commodity, no matter how quotidian or mundane, end of quote. Bodebiel's prioritization for marketable acts obliga obligated stars to work hard, constantly trying to outdo themselves through introducing new acts, songs, or dances, and surrendering to the tedious itinerary designed by the impresarios whose intention was to entice a bigger number of paying audiences to come to the shows for more profit. As a formula for achieving stardom, Vaudeville impresarios of the late 1920s, such as Borromeo Lu, attributed the following criteria. To beauty, 75% of the success of a star, while 50% of the success of a song or a singer is due to a becoming dress. Jacques Attali, in his landmark work on the political economy of music, Noise, argued that stars could make a fortune through the practice of popular art and posited that these earnings allowed for the fulfillment of the working class's dreams for social advancement. Tandoplin's story shows how Filipino vodabilistas responded to the emerging popular culture industry that created a space for social mobility as their mastery of American ways gave them power to negotiate their ambivalent status as colonial subjects. This was at the time when the U.S. was solidifying its empire in the islands in which Filipino music and talent were utilized to produce commodities that were consumed in the realm of music printing, music recording, and especially live performance. Vaudeville was an important genre of live performance that eventually dominated popular public entertainment and became an influential agent in the distribution and consumption of new musical commodities. In establishing the American insular government in the islands, the US introduced, and I quote, American ideals and the American way of life through a nationwide educational system, then later through the print and broadcast media and via film, end of quote, from Fernandez. Naturally, the use of English was instituted and it represented the language of modernity for the colonial subjects. The Americans were determined to educate Filipinos in English and expose them to US culture in order to influence their taste for popular entertainment and theatrical forms. This westernization of taste and consciousness was a necessary prerequisite for the acceptance of everything that the American government intended to advance, and these are, concepts of democracy and progress, consumer goods, education, and governance. In addition, American forms of art were used by the insular government to facilitate the realization of the colonial project. Banking on the established theater traditions in the islands, American vaudeville conveniently penetrated Manila's entertainment market and became the first visible theatrical influence from America. This paper interrogates the transculturation of vaudeville in the Philippines as popular music, focusing on how Filipino musicians responded to the capitalist imperatives of a growing market and audience, while maintaining a space for the negotiation of relations between the divergent cultures of the hegemonic empire and that of the colony. Borrowing the conceptual framework of cosmopolitanism, this article also examines the emergence of popular culture in the Philippines in an attempt to contextualize the articulation of local expressions in appropriating American vaudeville considered by Peter Kepi as pop cosmopolitanism par excellence. This study aims to answer the following questions. In its heyday, how did vaudeville contribute in the circulation of popular music in the Philippines? 
specifically as a venue for adopting new methods of advertising and selling songs, cheap music, and other commodified forms of music. How did vaudeville provide a space for social mobility among the colonial subjects, particularly entrepreneurial musicians who participated in popular cultural productions, which was a mark of modernity? And in the employment of the established circuits of popular industry and the adopted language of American popular music, how did Filipino musicians disseminate their expression to contradict the imperial venture of the US in the Pacific? Cosmopolitanism is defined as, I quote, an orientation, a willingness to engage with the other. It is an intellectual and aesthetic stance of openness toward divergent cultural experiences, a search for contrasts rather than uniformity, end of quote. Furthermore, Gilbert and Lohr reiterates cultural cosmopolitanism as a practice of navigating across cultural boundaries. Kepi, in his study of popular culture in the Philippines and Indonesia from 1920 to 1936, loosely defines it as receptiveness to alien cultures and is closely linked to the idea of modernity, which he explains as ideas and practice associated with progress and individual freedom. Moreover, borrowing from the concepts of Henry Jenkins in his study of American fandom of Japanese anime and Joel Kahn in his examination of popular culture and modernism, Kepi posits that both Jenkins and Kahn see the roles of non-elite in actively shaping and engaging in cosmopolitanism and modernity without associations of high culture and elite manipulations. He highlights the pivotal role of Luis Borromeo, a middle-class Filipino who helped to create a pop, pop cosmopolitanism and popular modernity in the Philippines by reworking the modernist meanings and texts of the elites on the one hand and constructing meanings for the masses on the other hand. Uh, when he localized vaudeville, vaudeville into the vaudeville. Vaudeville as an appropriation of a hegemonic cultural form by the colonial subjects exhibits the specific process that characterized Turino's view of cosmopolitanism in his study of the music of Zimbabwe, and I quote, as the interaction of local cultural practices with global processes." End of quote. Turinus' view on cosmopolis cosmopolitanism is summarized as a negotiation of the external with the internal, the foreign adapted to the native, the global in interaction with the local. The mixture of many local cultures within an established American form in the Filipinized vaudeville productions of the mid 1920s displays what Adil Johan in his study of P. Ramley's film music explained as a cosmopolitan cultural practice of articulating two or more contrasting identities simultaneously, which may not necessarily be divergent, but interactive and are the result of active aesthetic agency. It also signals the intention of cosmopolitan agents to attain competence and a sense of mastery of the culture of the other, which was initially alien to their local culture. The short but dynamic period of Bodabil's popularity in the Philippines affirms the cosmopolitan interconnectedness of divergent cultures through interaction and forged social relations, representing how Filipinos appropriated American cultural institutions to negotiate their position in the empire. Now, vaudeville in the Philippines. Vaudeville was brought to the islands in the early years of America's imperial project to entertain American troops assigned in the colony and featured foreign entertainers, mostly from the US mainland. It also entertained the general Manila audience who was then comprised of theater-going enthusiasts who frequented the opera, zarzuela, and other productions of the late 19th century, as well as the American residents of the new colony, the majority of whom could not understand the Spanish and Tagalog dialogues of many productions. In addition, the strong determination of the US to educate Filipinos in English was slowly instituting it to be the territory's lingua franca. The eventual attainment of English proficiency coupled with the exposure to American culture 
specifically popular entertainment, would change the Filipinos' taste and transform their reception and consumption of musical productions. Vaudeville was a showcase of popular culture from the US and it featured a potpourri of songs, dances, comedy skits, magical acts, contortionists, animal tricks, fire and sword eaters, and many other fascinating acts that enthralled audiences. As a mixture, as a mixture of entertainment acts, this genre has been, presented, has been present in the islands as early as the late 19th century, albeit not labeled as vaudeville and it was non-American. Under the vibrant theater tradition during the Spanish colonial period, one of the theater vedettes or stars, Valeriana Mauricio, also known as Chananay, ventured as an entrepreneur in establishing Compañía Dramática Lírica Coreográfica in 1885. This company combined four performance fields, also known as Cuadro de Compañía, which may have been inspired by the Compañía Lírica Coreográfica y Gymnástica that performed a benefit concert for China Nice Calls at Teatro Tondo on September 16, 1877. Aside from the usual singing of arias, these included dances and gymnastic performances that featured acts of the many Compañía Infantil groups that proliferated in Manila in the late 19th century. An example is Teatro Infantil de Aguilas, May, May 1896 program that included a symphonic piece, a short Tagalog drama, a waltz, two gymnastic acts performed by the Las Niñas de Aguila, aria singing, and a final act that featured two of the most popular stars of the Spanish period, Patrocinio Tagaroma and Eliseo Carvajal, who performed a Gran Zarzuela in one act entitled La Segunda Tiple. By 1897, Teatro Circo Filipino along Cali Echaga in Santa Cruz district featured a regular schedule for its Compañía Acrobática, Comica, Gymnastica y Pantomimica signifying that there was a stable patronage for productions of variety shows. Upon the shift in colonial engagement from Spain to the US in the early 20th century, many foreign vaudeville troops came to perform in the new and slowly Americanizing colony. Among the earliest vaudeville troops to visit the islands were the Lilliputians from the US in 1901, the Barovsky Imperial Circus from Russia in 1902, and Levy's Australian Vaudeville Company, which inaugurated the newly renovated Orpheum, which was the formerly Teatro Filipino, on September 9, 1903, to a full house. The newly opened theater and the visiting Australian company provided a novelty to the Manila audience that the newspaper article reported that the organizer of the Vaudeville show had to turn away hundreds who could not be accommodated even for a standing ovation. The program featured the usual many turns associated with vaudeville, and these were song and dance numbers, affairs, comedy skits, trapeze and slap wire acts, and gags. A noteworthy portion of the short article states that the Orpheum is to open continuously and run, I quote, on the lines of the vaudeville houses in the States, and it is intended to make the Orpheum the home of vaudeville in Manila, where arrangements have been completed to converge upon Manila, all the best vaudeville artists that come to the Orient." End of quote from the Manila Times, September 10, 1903. Having established the Orpheum Theater as the first home of vaudeville in Manila, its management intended to introduce new talents occasionally through obtaining contracts with vaudeville artists from the US and to keep the program fresh, lively, and up to date. The early success of vaudeville shows in the Orpheum is attested by the consistent reports of crowded houses, amused by the consistent changing of the program. Other features such as the Savoy and Lyric Theaters eventually recognized the popularity of vaudeville that they opened their doors to full house productions. Early on, the elegant Teatro Sorilla had presented vaudeville shows in Manila as early as August 1901, which announced the show of a visiting US troupe as, and I quote, 
a novelty in Manila, quote, which promised to feature a smorgasbord of good American entertainment that is an, an orchestra, beautiful lights and scenic effects, acrobats, contortionists, ragtime songs, among many. A marketing innovation introduced at the Orpheum a month after reopening its doors to the public was the presentation of an amateur night that furnished fresh talents and acts to its already engaging offering, contributing to its popularity and crowd drawing influence. The freshness and the variety offered by the discovery of new performers paved the way for vaudeville competitions that assured huge audiences. By 1918, Leonard Nelson, the manager of the vaudeville company house at the Savoy Theater, organized a competition that allowed candidates to perform any class of act they liked that was suitable to the stage. And these were musical acts, singing, dancing, acrobatics, juggling, tumbling, conjuring, feats of strength, magic tricks, comedy sketches, and many more. In addition to awarding the winner 100 pesos, an engagement at the vaudeville show at the Savoy Theater was promised and a possible tour to the leading theaters in Australia, New Zealand, India, and China. Many vaudeville productions prior to its localization in the 1920s were performed by visiting foreign vaudeville troops, mostly from the USA, bring, bringing with them songs, dances, and humor popular to American audiences. Presenting the same established formula applied by the many circuits of US vaudeville companies in their variety shows and being received warmly by an emerging popular music fandom from Manila's growing middle class, a developing taste for American popular culture became apparent. Fernandez mentions that there was an eminently receptive Filipino custom that embraced American culture which unquestionably made it become part of Filipino habit and frame of reference, partly due to the consideration that the conqueror's culture was superior to his own. In addition, Fernandez asserts that in Vaudeville's heyday, it was the venue by which American musical culture came painlessly, pleasurably, and almost unnoticeably into Philippine life at every level, and I quote, producing generations of Filipinos who sang of their feelings and thus thought of and analyzed them in American terms." End of quote. Now, transformation of vaudeville to vaudeville. Efforts to localize this popular American genre were initiated by a few returning Filipino artists from the US. In 1916, Domingo, also known as Sunday, Rean Tasso, attempted to introduce Filipino elements into vaudeville shows being presented in Manila and founded its first Philippine vaudeville company. It is Borromeo Lu who is credited for establishing the localized vaudeville. His shows featured a mixture of American popular songs with local genres such as the Kundiman, and a number of newly composed dance music by Filipino composers, Filipino Foxtrot, Tango Foxtrot, Himno One Step, and Philippin Filipino Tango Foxtrot. Borromeo applied the formula blending Spanish, English, and Tagalog songs, dances, topical com comedic routines, and everything from juggling to boxing tricks, which influenced the rise of other Filipino vaudeville troops. troops. He innovated and revitalized the theater tradition in the Philippines and transformed the older elitist Hispanic cosmopolitanism into a Filipino pop cosmopolitanism for the masses. By the mid 1920s, a number of bodybuilding companies shared the limelight with his Borromeo Follies, which gave weekly performances at Manila's Olympic Stadium. These were the variety stars and the smart set House at the Lux Theater, the Rivoli Amusement Company at the Rivoli Theater, and the Savoy Nifties at the Savoy Theater. Assuming a cultural brokerage position, Borromeo's successful contribution to the creation of a pop cosmopolitanism 
with his vaudeville shows could also be attributed to his entrepreneurial skills, which banked on the marketability of stars and the advantageous utilization of established capitalist infrastructure in the distribution of popular culture in the Philippines. In his localized vaudevilles, Borromeo relied on the adapted taste of the Filipino audience towards American stars and featured their local mimics. He is widely revered for having discovered, developed, and promoted local Filipino talents, a few of whom would, be, would later be regarded as stars of vaudeville, such as Katie de la Cruz, Diana Toy, Canoplin, and Atang de la Rama, among others. These local entertainers did not simply imitate their American originals. They appropriated the popular music culture of American vaudeville, but at the same time, creatively marking their performances with elements that portrayed local sensibilities and traditions. In others, they even went beyond the limits of stereotypifying traditions as to provide an alternative modernity, such as the case of Katie de la Cruz's Dittis. In defying the traditional notion of a virtuous and modest Filipina in her performances, de la Cruz posited a new image of a free moving woman emancipated from the confines of conventions and not embarrassed to put forward issues about sexuality and female empowerment. The stages of the vaudeville stand as witnesses to the emergence of a new image of the Filipina, providing a proof that the colony was a space where alternative modernities were exercised. Similarly, Canoplin's inclusion of pathetic magic tricks into his act mimicking Charlie Chaplin was also a representation of modernity. Besides replicating an American original, Canoplin innovated his program with a saleable novelty that ensured continued patronage from ticket buying public. As political debates on the readiness of Filipinos for sovereignty escalated in the late 1920s, the display for their, of their capacity to be equipped with modernity was an important requisite imposed by the Americans. The US colonial government aimed to mold the Filipinos who were regarded as immature, weak, and unhygienic into productive, well-ordered, and sanitary subjects. The Filipinos' inherent adeptness of mimicry was to signal the imperial government that they were ready for independence. In her study of migrant Filipina taxi dancers of continental US, San Pablo Burns asserted that colonial mimicry is the, I quote, strictest form of ideological disciplining and the ultimate corporeal evidence of the success of the American imperial project, end of quote. In the entertainment spaces of the vaudeville, mimicry was not a simple emulation of a hegemonic icon, but an understated articulation of patriotism, hinting at resistance towards imperialism. The replication of American stars in the localized vaudeville stage by Filipino vaudevillistas was an appropriation of established commodified forms of music that were used for negotiating emancipation from cultural and political subjugation. In addition, Borromeo lose shift from performer composer into a director impresario eventually transformed the vaudeville into its Filipinized form and attempted to elevate its status as a legitimate theater production. A few vaudeville impresarios who managed the Savoy and Lyric theaters also attempted to keep their offerings within the bounds of respectability in their intention to make vaudeville reputable. A particular move that aided Borromeo's goal to raise vaudeville's legitimacy was to include highly respected and popular stars, or I term them vedettes, of their earlier zarzuela and opera theaters of the late 19th century into his shows, such as Honorata Atang de la Rama. These efforts show how producers grappled with vaudeville's reputation that was marred with vulgarity, loose morals, and cultural erosion. One of the ways Borromeo transformed his vaudevilles was to make them socially relevant. He incorporated short plays and comedy skits into his shows, which slowly became permanent features of the localized vaudeville. 
early on, he also experimented on adapting short comedies from European operas and Spanish zarzuelas to capture the upper and middle class theater patrons of the Spanish period. Borromeo's shows evolved from a classy musical review into an eclectic Filipinized format that combined music, dance, and drama with a short play that included a social issue driven content at its core around which other acts from acrobatics to boxing were arranged. In the short plays, vaudeville presentations tackled issues such as the plight of professional female taxi dancers uh, who are also known, who are also known as bailarinas of Manila's cabarets, the modernizing attitude of young Filipina maidens and the troubled private lives of vaudevillistas, among others. Moreover, Another feature added to the vaudeville, which became a standard act, was the Hawaiian hula, a curious but nostalgic link to the culture of Hawaii, where Filipinos labored in the early 20th century as plantation workers. In the early years of the 20th century, the icon of the hula girl was used to advertise Hawaii to the US continent. The burgeoning tourist industry of Hawaii regarded the hula dance and its accompanying music as an important commodity that represented on stage the promise of intimacy and affection towards the US embodied by Hawaiian women in hula performances. The live performance of the hula dance in its com commodified form through paid tickets was the way the US experienced Hawaii in the mainland and its popular reception provided promises of fame and social mobility to the female dancers who were otherwise glued to the island's plantation industries. Perhaps its success in the continent's entertainment industry triggered the marketability of the hula dance in Philippine vaudeville productions as a mimicry of another profitable entertainment genre that resembled their predicament as a cultural outsider to the hegemonic culture of the American empire. Hawaii might have stood as the closest possibility of assimilation to the lionized dream, American dream because of its similarity with the Philippine tropical environment and colonial history, as well as serving as the gateway to the US through the Hawaiian islands need for plantation laborers. The imitation of hula dance being the most visible cultural representation of Hawaii in vaudeville productions also created an imaginary link between Filipina dancers and their Hawaiian counterparts whose dream of glamour, fame, and elevation towards a middle class status became achievable through their commodification. In this way, local female hula dancers engaged with the culture of the imperial other and navigated their way across cultural boundaries within the empire, a mark of their cosmopolitanism. Vaudeville and the music market. The popularity of vaudeville in the 1920s coincided with the transformed taste for American products by the colonial population. With their impro improved economic condition resulting from employment in the established insular bureaucracy and the growing economic infrastructure of capitalism, Filipinos adopted a modern lifestyle marked by, by their preference for and purchase of imported commodities. In Gonzaga's study on consumerism in Manila's commercial streets from the 1930s and to the 1960s, he argued that Filipinos encountered I quote, modernity as a disorienting situation in which they confronted unfamiliar realities without having the knowledge or capability to do so, end of quote. It was necessary for Filipinos to depend on American and other imported products that flooded the luxury shopping street of Escolta to express their effort in assimilating into modernity and accentuate their transcendent newness awkwardly altering their appearance, behavior, and attitude. The immense audience reach of vaudeville productions benefited this growing consumerism among the new Filipino middle class through providing a space for advertising. In Borromeo's case, his business connection with the boxing promoters and co-owners of the Olympic Stadium, Frank Churchill and Eddie Taft, where his vaudeville company was based, lured him to include boxing training stunts in his shows 
to assist in advertising the weekly boxing bout at the same entertainment arena. In addition, the popularity of vaudeville shows also aided in the introduction of consumer goods such as the toothpaste brand Colgate and cinematographic films taken from Peter Kepi. The popularity of vaudeville shows was also a great marketing avenue for advertising new compositions, banking on both the star appeal of the chosen interpreter and the assured patronage of the theater going public. Vaudeville introduced new compositions to the fast developing domestic music making market comprised of piano owning middle class Filipino families who became the established market of printed sheet music mostly dances. Filipino composers grabbed the chance to write music that was marketable in order to participate in the business of music commodification. They also utilized the established infrastructure of Manila's popular music market in generating profit from their labor. Related to the ideology of the star is the economic benefits of hit songs in which enormous fortunes are earned by songwriters who capitalize on their work of writing music as a means to make a living. As Schenker iterates, one of the reasons for writing music is to generate an income. For the Filipino composers of vaudeville music, it was necessary to attain a stylistic versatility in order to reach a wide range of consumers to maximize profits. The burgeoning popular culture of the 1920s favored the modern sounds of jazz music that was related to social dances such as the Foxtrot, Tango, Charleston, One Step, and Two Step. Composers who were adept at this popular idiom, such as Borromeo, capitalized on their fluency in this imperial language and created works that disseminated a wide range of expressions reflecting a distinct Filipino culture. The lucrativeness of publishing popular dance music, which were regarded as cheap, light, baneful and mere imitation also lured composers who were trained in the Western classical idiom that was propagated by the newly established University of the Philippines Conservatory of Music, such as Francisco Santiago and Nicanor Abelardo. Despite his classical training, Abelardo exemplifies the Filipino musician who knew how to maneuver along Manila's burgeoning music market and capitalized on music's commodification. He combined his work as a young music professor at the conservatory with his big time salon playing at the Santa Ana Cabaret, Cabaret catering to the musical dilettantism of the social elite uh, in order to augment his income. As a result, he composed works which adapted to the jazz idiom and assimilated the latest dance rhythms of American popular entertainment music. Abelardo's composition, Nakku Kenkoi, with text by Romualdo G. Ramos and labeled as a fax trot, was published in 1930. The short song is in two sections, which are both in the key of C major. It is set in duple meter with the typical fax trot bounds in between strong beats. The song describes the comical character, Kenkoi, created by Tony Velasquez which became a popular figure of an awkwardly Americanized Filipino. Ken Koy donned an oversized white cotton suit with his hair slicked back with pomade and spoke in broken English. This character may be regarded as the caricature version of vaudeville superstar Kanuklin, who also fashioned himself in the same mode. The text of the song is narrated in the point of view of a third person and the first verse tells of the inescapable likelihood of meeting Kenkoi everywhere with his notorious attire, transformed colonial attitude, and pathetic attempt to speak English. The second verse describes Kenkoi as a popular entertainer present in all celebrations, providing music with his ukulele, dancing with exaggerated moves, and howling uncontrollably. This imagery of Kenkoi as depicted in the song unmistakably connects him to vaudeville, whose popularity and ever presence in the entertainment scene is alluded to by Ramos and Abelardo. The song's foxtrot rhythm characterizes the refrain, probably designed by Abelardo for a choreographic performance as the singer dances while rendering the text that goes, 
pati nooy inahit na kilos lakad ay nag-iba habang da- daay kumakanta ng Ingles na walang pera, na walang letra, may ukelele pa. Batiin mo, kumusta ka? At ang sagot, tingnan mo ba? Hey, Tagalog, mi no habla. Ay, nako, nako, kengkoy. And the translation is, is here. Um, and may I just um, beg for your indulgence. I will shift to uh, another screen and let you listen to uh, let you listen to the music. Uh, stop share. I will use this one. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. It is only in the second to the last line that the character of Ken Koi sings, providing the audience a hint of his comical voice when he declares that he does not speak Tagalog, albeit he utters a short Spanish line, me no habla, or in short, I do not speak, not English. 
This displays his attempt to appear assimilated to the hegemonic culture of a colonizer, but erroneously exhibiting his adeptness to that of Spain, despite being described in the song as having been Americanized. Regardless of the seeming confusion, his short answer in a foreign language reveals a preference for the ways of the other, neglecting his own because it accentuated his attained culture of modernity, highlighting his cosmopolitanism and colonial integration. In this comical song, Abelardo emphasized the difficulty of the locals in responding to the shifting colonial engagement from Spain to the US as it meant adapting to different lifestyles, culture, and language. Ken Coy's short and apparent spontaneous reply in Spanish hints at his incomplete cleansing of a deep-rooted enculturation of a po former colonizer's culture while he struggles to adapt to American ways, a comical representation of a serious early 20th century Filipino predicament. As Gonzaga iterated, Ken Coy's broken English displayed in the serialized Tagalog language Liwaiwai magazine of the late 1930s reveals, and I quote, the difficulty in smoothly reconciling seemingly incongruous realities during that period, end of quote. As a caricature of small framed Filipino man donning oversized white cotton suit and pomaded slicked back hairstyle, also the popularized image of Canoplin in his vaudeville shows, Ken Koy was a representation of how they grappled with modernity marred with comic awkwardness. An exact opposite of, to the fashion donned by longtime Filipino migrants to the US who were established white collar practitioners. These migrant Filipinos wore expensive custom field suits from tailor shops, which represented their achievement as successful professionals in the continent. This visual measure distinguished them as modern American and distinct from those who have recently arrived in the continent. They have, all, they have even been likened to Hollywood movie stars who don't stylish suits that were two to three years ahead of new trends. In the colony, the Vogue was to wear what was sported by American officials whom the locals appropriated in their mimicry of people in power, as well as what they considered modern. As this tendency for imitation proliferated in all social classes, those who could not afford tailor-made suits purchased ready-to-wear and some, which were either handed down by Americans or exact replicas using local and more affordable fabric. This could explain the oversized fitting of the popular white suit on the smaller body frame of the Filipinos. Nonetheless, it was an external manifestation of the colonial subjects transformed bodies through the aid of consumer products that provided a semblance of cosmopolitanism. Ken Koy and its closest bodybuilding embodiment, Kanuplin, demonstrates how non-exact replication of the representation of modernity even though it was a cause for blatant embarrassment, was embraced in dealing with cosmopolitan channels, notwithstanding the possible awkwardness and defeat of the encounter. Conclusion. The immense popularity of vaudeville among Manila's theater-going public in the 1920s fortified its power to promote the consumption of music, particularly its commodified form. The established infrastructure of Manila's music market enabled musicians to maneuver their way towards economic affluence using their labor to generate income and establish distribution network to reach a wide range of customers in order to accumulate more profit. The capitalist imperative of competition gave rise to the ideology of star, hit songs, and box office success all of which converge through the potent appeal of the popular, a marker in the ramification of successful cultural industries. Tracing Bodebilt's proliferation in the 1920s and bringing to the fore the cases of a few of its stars and prime movers provide an understanding of how the concept of cosmopolitanism may be applied to examinations of cultural interactions and negotiations with imperial and colonial circumstances. It shows how capitalist infrastructures applied by popular culture industries were open for exploitation, 
particularly by those who are willing to engage with the culture of the other, shaping a modernity that highlighted an individual's free agency. Those who possess the cosmopolitan attitude, such as entrepreneurship, gained access to maneuver within the highly divided social spaces of colonial societies, allowing them to navigate fluidly in the transforming mode of cultural productions in the second half of the 20th century. As the, prom as the most prominent popular entertainment form of the 1920s, Baudeville offered social mobility to those who captured the essence of cosmopolitanism. Those who were not fluid enough, as in the desolate case of Canopulin, who stagnated with this unchanged formula for his once popular Baudeville acts, were left out when new technologies such as the talking movies, television, and radio were introduced. More than the economic benefits of Baudeville, its transculturation in the islands opened an avenue for musical expressions that surpassed mere imitations of American popular music. Filipino composers as agents of cosmopolitanism negotiated with this imperial culture by employing US forms as foundations for musical expressions that were slowly becoming recognized as markedly Filipino. In their compositions and eventual performances, this framed fluency in the imperial language cannot be confined to a simple exhibition of mimicry that was devoid of meaning. Rather, they became the medium for intercultural realizations where a reciprocal exchange of cultures transpired. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Arvin Tan. Now, uh, we open uh, this uh, lecture with uh, your questions. You can type in the chat box your questions and I'm just going to read it. Um, also, yung sa YouTube uh, channel, I think Jack will uh, indicate here is a chat box so I can just read that. Um, okay, waiting for your questions. Original questions, comments, um, you know, additional input, whatever you, you want to. Um. Okay, I don't, I don't see. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's, words, uh, it's difficult to write some questions in the text. Okay, okay, so I, you can just verbally say it, I guess, yeah. Oh, okay, now I see one uh, from Dr. Timilios, Sir Rick. Uh, do you see a parallel of the transformation of uh, vaudeville to vaudeville and the 1970s American pop to OPM? Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, yes. Uh, hello, Dr. Timilios. Thank you for attending this uh, professorial chair lecture. Um, Similarly, I think uh, the change from an Americanized vaudeville into its localized form of vaudeville uh, transpired in the late 70s, in which we hear many of the American uh, pop hits of the US uh, being uh, Filipinized also in the form of uh, placadong uh, uh, rendition by uh, Filipino uh, local artists, and um, as I think um, many all, many know about it, that uh, Filipino singers can uh, well mimic uh, original sounds, such as uh, um, uh, I remember Karen Carpenter uh, being um, mimicked in the Philippines with a singer who has the same quality and timbre of voice and uh, many others like uh, as mentioned in the paper Elvis Presley and uh, Perry Como and many others. So uh, I think the transformation from uh, uh, vaudeville to vaudeville 
uh, uh, would somehow be uh, repeated in the uh, 70s with the uh, popular music industry. And both of them were uh, uh, under the, uh, I would say, the manipulative uh, power of capitalism or uh, the commodification of music in the form of records and uh, uh, in, in the uh, 70s in the form of uh, long playing albums, cassette tapes, and then later on CDs. Thank you for that question. And he has a comment here, uh, Sir Rick said that I'm thinking that there may be a Filipino or a Southeast Asian logic of practice in play. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Okay, from uh, Dr. Laverne de la Pena, did uh, Bodabil eventually move to the new medium of film? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, according to my research, uh, Bodabil. Uh, moved not into uh, film, but in television. Um, because in uh, when I was growing up, I remember watching That's Entertainment on Channel 7. And it featured the smorgasbord of um, uh, what Bodabil was offering. And also in the 1970s, uh, as we know, Bodabil has, um, I, I would say, uh, relegated into becoming a uh, uh, I would say burlesque show, which was a uh, reason for it to be uh, a source of uh, immorality sometimes. And people watched uh, and they regarded vaudeville shows as something mundane. And so uh, with the, uh, um, yeah, um, looking at it, and later on, um, in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, we see the transformation of vaudeville into something that is uh, uh, seen by uh, lower, lower class uh, from the social hierarchy uh, and as a source of entertainment. But later on, it moved to a, a new technology, which was uh, the television in the form of uh, variety shows. And up to now, I think we see these variety shows uh, donning our television sets uh, on Sunday afternoons. Uh, yes, uh, Filipinos are really entertained by the uh, short, uh, many different short uh, segments because I suppose um, they really like to be uh, given uh, a variety of uh, entertainment possibilities. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, from Ching Magpile, as Bodabil is an American influence, what happened to it under the Japanese occupation of the Philippines? After the World War II, did Bodabil and its performers resume with uh, theater performance or shifted to a different path? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ching, for that question. Uh, I think the future of vaudeville from the time that you were asked the, the, after the japanese period or the, the, uh, it shifted it continued to uh, to be shown but uh, it no longer was uh, as popular as before because there was already the emergence of new uh, entertainment uh, uh, possibilities as i say the, the entrance of uh, movies television and uh, radio um, in the time of the Japanese period, they, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they allowed for the propagation of vaudeville because it was uh, probably uh, safe entertainment because it uh, uh, it showed dances and uh, uh, comedy skits and acrobatics, and it was not as uh, controversial as uh, zarzuelas or uh, operas in which uh, hidden messages of patriotism and uh, perhaps uh, uh, inciting revolution against the Japanese imperial government uh, could be uh, subduedly uh, included as a message in presenting opera productions or Sarsuela productions. So uh, I think Jap the Japan imperial government allowed for the uh, proliferation of vaudeville uh, productions 
because it was, I think, the safest way of entertainment during that time. And also the most popular. Okay. Um, my Cosantaea has a very long uh, <laughs> message and <laughs> question. Okay, I'll just read it. I'm interested in the conceptualization of cosmopolitan, um, cosmopolitanism in the Philippines, especially, but also for Southeast Asia at large. Turino's rationale of cosmopolitanism involves the reception of alien cultures. In many ways, that is what leads Kepi, K E P P Y, to conceive yeah. that um, cosmopolitanism and vaudeville, specifically as pop cosmopolitanism, sorry, per excellence. No? So during the early 20th century, a number of countries at the time were dealing with the development of local modernities to music, such as Kong and uh, art songs in, in Indonesia, jazz in Malaysia with the advent of Filipino musicians and new music compositions in Thailand. So rather than viewing cosmopolitanism as the unidirectional reception of Western culture, is there a way of conceptualizing the process from a Southeast Asian perspective that involves the development of multiple identities, including a cosmopolitan one? Thank you, Michael, for that um, question and also for uh, the very no, long clarification. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I think uh, cosmopolitanism as a theory, theoretical framework, is uh, uh, very helpful and uh, is apt to, uh, to use as a frame, as a lens in analyzing the negotiation that happened between uh, uh, colonizers uh, in the 20th century and uh, many of the colonies in the south in the Southeast Asian region, and uh, just like the idea of transculturation, uh, it is always a, a negotiation, not imposing the uh, culture of the other or the uh, colonizer over the, the subjugated uh, uh, population, and uh, trying to come up with. Uh, music that mimics their compositional techniques, but it is really uh, uh, an avenue where um, composers or artists of the region can uh, really express what is innate in their culture and let it come out using the, uh, let's say, compositional form or uh, uh, musical structure of uh, Western um, Western um, traditions. So uh, it's really uh, a manifestation of how the, in, I would say, Southeast Asian region uh, artists and composers uh, really uh, bring out what is um, unique to their culture and using the, the techniques from the West or from the colonizer, they can, uh, uh, yeah, they can uh, bring out something that is uniquely Southeast Asian. I see this, uh, for example, happening now with uh, K-pop, because as we know, K-pop is now very, very strong uh, uh, industry or commodity in the worldwide uh, uh, culture industry or pop music industry, and they even have a very high offering of stocks already, uh, as mentioned by BBC about two weeks ago. And uh, this uh, K-pop, uh, I think as a tradition, uh, borrows its form from American and Western uh, popular uh, boy band groups in the beginning. And now they have uh, 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 improved on it and uh, although the music is still very much Western, but the idea of uh, Koreans performing on stage with uh, very active moves that typically only see this in Western uh, uh, performers, uh, we see that there is now a negotiation, uh, a, a clear negotiation between uh, West and East in, in terms of uh, uh, coming up with something that is uh, uh, economically lucrative and uh, yeah, uh, something that is uh, termed 
can be termed as uh, the success of stars in uh, the modern um, culture industry or not, sorry not culture in the pop music industry okay and uh professor patricia silvestre added a comment here there's definitely a filipino logic of practice in play no? borromeo lu presented a vaudeville close to the native scene with for example a bit of real manila life at the stadium in 1925 as seen in the tribute tribunes rather Thank you so much, Mampat. Thank you, Mampat. Yeah. And David Kendall here asks, um, does the rise of Bodebil parallel a simultaneous decline in Sarsuela? Or do they both enjoy popularity with one considered highbrow and the other lowbrow as more popular entertainment? Was it the purpose of Lou Borromeo to raise the highbrow cultural profile of the Bodebil? shows by the inclusion of opera and sarsuela numbers okay oh. that's his question yeah. yeah thank you dr kendall for that question uh i try to answer one by one uh the first question was was uh during the bodabills uh heyday uh what happened to the sarsuelas um in the early 1910s we know that uh, sarsuela productions were uh, the, the Filipinized version already, Sarsuela with the letter S, uh, we see that this has become an avenue for um, those who were fighting for Philippine independence during the revolution. Uh, they, made this, ma they made it as avenue to uh, present their subdued uh, nationalistic uh, aspirations. And so uh, the US uh, colonial government uh, in a way branded these as, um, uh, I forget what they were, uh, the, uh, sarsuelas that Subversive, are- Subversive uh, maybe? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Subversive, Subversive, is it? Yeah, sarsuelas. And uh, uh, also as mentioned in the paper, uh, in the early 1910s, 1920s, uh, there was a, a move towards uh, trying to become modern and anything that was American was considered as a sign of modernity uh, on the population, on the local population. So at that time, uh, vaude vaudeville being presented in the Philippines for the first time with American uh, actors, American singers, uh, paved the way for a uh, 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 shift to this type of um, um, uh, reception no? to uh, vaudeville. And so at the time when vaudeville became uh, the most prominent, uh, prominent uh, theater production of the time, Sarsuela slowly uh, went backwards and uh, many of the producers of uh, the new technology of film um, banked on the established uh, market for uh, live Zarzuela productions. And the very first films that were produced during the time were stories from Zarzuelas, uh, such as, I think, Walang Sugat, um, yeah. And uh, so um, there was shift from Sarsuela to uh, the movie or film technology. And uh, it was because I think the audience already shifted its um, like uh, preference for a different kind of uh, uh, production. However, we see that uh, they, the elite still had high regard for uh, these Sarsuela and opera productions. That's why uh, in the late 30s, uh, Lou Borromeo um, tried to uh, heighten the already diminishing uh, uh, impression on Bodeville because of the, uh, they say it, beca it became more mundane, more uh, light, more light entertainment, cheap. Uh, to elevate Bodeville, his Bodevilles, um, he incorporated snippets of uh, earlier opera productions or Sarsuela productions. So in a way, uh, they, they still were present in the vaudeville, but 
it was they were uh, in shorter version. So this is like to include a serious thing or a serious uh, entertainment uh, kind in a variety of light, uh, uh, jolly, or uh, uh, happy uh, entertainment uh, program. So uh, the presence of uh, these opera excerpts and Zarzuela excerpts were uh, lent uh, to the Baudeville, uh, some kind of a legitimizing uh, stamp that it still can be uh, can be consumed or enjoyed by the uh, higher uh, higher social class. So for giving them some kind of an elite uh, elite kind of entertainment, and also probably it's a way to educate the uh, masses who were really the uh, uh, patrons of Bodabil Productions. Okay, similarly, uh, Dr. Byrne also added here that can you say something about the dynamics between Sarsuela and Bodabil since they coexisted? Did they share the same market? Christine, I think that's been answered. Okay, thank you. Okay, siya. okay so. thank you, okay. sir Byrne. No. <laughs> okay, let's move to uh, Brian Virai. So, um, okay, he, he's from DSCTA. Uh, just to add, Bodabil during the Japanese period, without the Japanese soldiers realizing it, Bodabil performances featured anti Japanese skits. For example, the Filipino Review, produced by Joe Klimako, had a satirical skit starring Togo and Pugo, two well loved comedians of the period. In an improvised skit, they called each other Pugito and Tugito, as the letter mock a Japanese general for having the same name from La Peña Bonifacio study and Teramiwada. So he made a comment. Congratulations, Paul. Thank you so much, Brian. Mirai. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you for that enlightenment. Okay, from Dr. Sandy Chua. I agree that rather than a unidirectional influence of appropriation of an American culture, there should be a more complex process of cosmopolitanism to bring out local responses. Thank you, Sandy. Okay. Thank from you, Alison Dr. Sandy Chua. <laughs> from Alison Miralles here. Uh, can it also be said that the vaudeville became indigenized into the Filipino way of life to transformation and adaptation as a response to the needs of the producers and consumers of that time? He's just uh, sharing his thoughts. Yes. Thank you, uh, Alison, for that question. I think, yes, it can be said that it was uh, like that, you know, indigenized uh, in the, uh, uh, as mentioned from vaudeville, it became vaudeville, and then later uh, the Filipinized version, which is vaudeville. And we know it as uh, really more vaudeville. Uh, um, and uh, in the late, uh, 40s, 50s, when it's about to uh, see its demise already, it has Bodabil has re um, been reduced to what they say uh, uh, burlesque shows. And so uh, from vaudeville to Bodabil and then to burlesque. Okay, and uh, Dr. Tumilis added that the term, instead of you mentioned earlier, a subverted or a subversion, is actually yeah. seditious. Said, yes, thank you very much, seditious. Dr. Tumilis. <laughs> <laughs> seditious, uh, yeah. Seditious, okay. uh, sorry, sorry, no. seditious <laughs> operas, yes. Okay. Uh, My memory is very poor. Yeah. <laughs> From Professor Pat Silvestre, did the late 19th century variety shows such as Comica, Gymnastica, Bailables, Integrate Tagalog Comedia Acts such as the be popular Moro Moro, as this was indeed highly popular then? Mm -hmm. uh, Mampat, yeah, thank you for that question. I think uh, in the, it was Moro Moro would have been included in the Filipino theaters. Uh, but these uh, compania uh, choreographica, compania uh, lyrica, dramatica, all of these, uh, they were really, I think, more um, catering to the uh, to the uh, opera going public of the late nineteenth century, which was uh, the more elite and uh, more upper upper middle middle class. So uh, uh, I think. Um, Moro Moro was favored 
and was preferred by uh, the many theater houses in the uh, Santa Cruz area, such as uh, uh, Teatro Tondo, perhaps, Teatro Di Masalang, Teatro uh, uh, was in San Jose. Uh, yes. Um, so not all of these uh, uh, compañía uh, choreographica, lyrica, dramatica would have included Moro Moro. They, they were really more like uh, showing uh, the predecessors of uh, the later vaudeville, which was really a variety show. Uh, I think early on when uh, uh, operas were introduced to the Philippines in the 1860s, uh, they showed the entire operas. But we see that with the uh, growing uh, number of uh, orchestras and bands that could play many of these opera, favorite opera arias, there were shows, I think, in the late 1880s and early 1890s that already showcased only the favorite arias in a show. So in a way, it's like a variety show already, but it was focused on uh, songs from the operas. But uh, later, perhaps, uh, in the uh, empresarios of the time also thought of uh, offering something different and something more interesting than just by uh, giving opera arias, but included dancing and uh, acrobatics and uh, in, in addition to singing. And Sandy added, I was just thinking of uh, if Adolfi's films are a continuation of the vaudeville tradition. Adolfi's so, films, yeah. vaudeville tradition? Uh, maybe, yes. Uh, I'm not so familiar with all of Dolphy's uh, movies, but the comedic aspect of Dolphy's life probably uh, link, is, can be linked to the popularity and the bankability of stars that uh, have a uh, comedic uh, character, such as Canuplin. Yeah? The, those uh, actors who made fun of themselves and, uh, you know, when uh, audience liked, uh, liked one character like that, they would patronize a star like this until they become very rich and uh, so I think Dolphy was uh, one of such one such character. In fact, many of the uh, many of the prominent personalities of radio in the beginning of 1930s, 40s that went on to during the war and after the war, such as Chichai, Pugo, Tugo, uh, Deli Atayatayan, uh, and then Ading Fernando. All of these. Uh, 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 famous stars uh, of the television in the 1960s and 70s originated from uh, becoming comedy skit uh, players in the radio programs that were also coming from uh, the tradition of the vaudeville. Yeah. It's, it's really uh, short skits, but entertaining and funny. Okay, from Patricia Lopez. May I know your thoughts on the role of parody in these popular uh, popular forms and how it figured into the frame of cosmopolitanism and mimicry? Mm -hmm. um, parody, um, as seen in the vaudevilles, were really more like uh, uh, seen in the mimics or mimicry of uh, bank bankable and uh, established stars of the U.S. Uh, circuit, no? either vaudeville or cinema or uh, film circuit, no? And uh, yeah, uh, the, the role of uh, parody in uh, uh, vaudeville performances would uh, entice more audience to really laugh and see the social events happening in their, uh, in their time. But at the same time, uh, uh, vaudeville being a light entertainment, showed how it can uh, it can become uh, not so serious so uh, people went to bodybuild productions to be entertained that's first and foremost and so uh, every time we see a parody of something serious 
we always um, in a way laugh and uh, enjoy enjoy seeing something being imitated maybe not uh, in the form of simple mimicry but imitated and then we see we get entertained when uh, the characters uh, introduce something in their thoughts in their uh, characters thought not from the original uh, source of the uh, of the thing which is being paradise or parod parodied no? So uh, my thoughts on parody in Bodeville, uh, it was not as prominent as simple mimicry because the idea of uh, stars during the time was really more on uh, uh, banking on the established uh, marketability of uh, popular stars already. And we see that in parody, normally we, uh, we tackle issues that are serious, and so serious uh, personalities, and uh, not not so uh, entertaining. So, very few, uh, very few parodies uh, can be uh, can be extracted from uh, archives of uh, uh, vaudeville productions. Yeah. Okay, from uh, Mercedes Duhunko, congrats, Professor Tan. Was there any use of vaudeville towards uh, irony and satire against the American colonizers and their occupation of the country? Or were Filipinos so enamored by American culture that there were no attempts in criticizing or protesting American colonization? Mm -mm. I think uh, more, than, uh, more than criticizing, uh, the Filipinos were really welcoming to the Americans because they see, or they had a, I would say, mistaken notion of this uh, uh, benevolent assimilation. Uh, like uh, they see America as uh, a big brother. Um, I say it's a mistaken notion because uh, it was also some kind of an imperial uh, imperial uh, domination that uh, tried to uh, uh, they, they came to the Philippines because uh, mainly because they wanted to have more avenues to present their uh, shows this is controversial statement so uh, I'm, I might be wrong please correct me if I am wrong so uh, it was not really more uh, like a contradiction or a criticism of the American uh, presence in the Philippines. But during that time, uh, many Filipinos really embraced America because uh, it was still fresh from, the, uh, from their experience, the difference between Spanish colonial ex government and that American colonial government. In the 300 years or more of Spanish colonization, um, we see a very small percentage of the local population able to speak in Spanish, which is contrasted to the efforts of the American uh, colonial government in which uh, only in one decade, they have successfully uh, penetrated the minds of the Filipino people because they used uh, education and they also taught the Filipinos to speak in English. And this, I think, is a, a very important uh, uh, factor why Filipinos uh, easily uh, got into their minds the uh, acceptance to uh, the acceptance of American way of life, American culture, American tradition. So uh, I would say vaudeville was not really a an avenue for um, uh, contradictory or uh, barring from David Irving's uh, uh, term, contrapunt, uh, counterpoint to uh, the colonial experience. But it was more like um, uh, um, really more, I see it in economic or capitalist point of view that uh, it was really more seen as an avenue to advance social mobility and to really um, uh, become more 
uh, expressions or exhibition of modernity. So, um, I so I see vaudeville not as a, a criticism or as an avenue for showing much of these uh, American uh, American uh, anti-American feelings. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, Mary Talusan Lacanale, you mentioned that American military musicians performed uh, vaudeville during the early colonial period. They were African Americans from the 24th Infantry and were very popular. Could you elaborate on how we might further critique the representation of American popular culture in the Philippines by highlighting that so much of American popular uh, such as ragtime actually originated in or had roots in black culture? Yes, thank you, Dr. Mary Ann Nakanlale for the question and thank you for attending my lecture. <laughs> um, yes, I would say that uh, the early 20th century music scene was really uh, a result of many uh, African-American uh, sentiments, uh, expression of sentiments. It's a, the idea of uh, jazz, uh, ragtime, uh, foxtrot, all of these, um, they really um, they really have, uh, I would say, uh, uh, gotten their roots from the experience of uh, the African-American community in uh, the mainland US. And also, we must not forget that uh, in the in this period of time, uh, the Philippine Constabulary Band, which is the uh, topic uh, that um, Miss uh, Doctor Talusan is uh, really um, uh, very good at, uh, um, shows that uh, Walter Loving uh, was an African American uh, conductor of the Philippine Constabulary Band. We see that. After a while, when he went to the States uh, to do another assignment, he would be uh, called back to assume the position. And uh, we see that uh, there is a connection between uh, the local population and the African-American uh, 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 community in, the, in both uh, the musical scene and in the colonial government in the form of uh, leadership in the uh, PC band, etc. Uh, so I would say that many of the music that was entertaining at the time and also uh, seen as, mark, as a mark of modernity had its roots in, uh, in the African-American uh, community of the US, uh, particularly that of uh, the emerging jazz and many of the dances. Uh, uh, also, although not uh, from the African American community, the tango also became a very popular um, dance uh, dance form in the Manila cabaret, and also as uh, piano music uh, being sold as a music sheet uh, to the middle class. Uh, population of Manila during that time. Okay, and, and uh, thank you. <laughs> we just added something here. If uh, Kaluplin was the local version of Chaplin, Dolphy and Panchito were our Laurel and Hardy. Yes. <laughs> thank you for that, Sir Vern. I did. I am not so familiar with Laurel and Hardy. Ah, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Doctor Tan, can you indicate in the chat box your email address in case there be uh, questions later? Because you know, um, we so far the chat box ended here, but they might ask more questions. So you might just um, input your um, email address for further inquiry later. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, audience, you can just. Uh, you can take note of the email address. Yeah, my email address is aqtan at up.edu.ph. All right. So in acknowledgement, um, again, we'd like to thank the, um, the Metro Manila Commission for this uh, professorial lecture. Also, uh, Dr. Laverne, Laverne de la Pena, Dr. Jose Buenconsejo. Also, special thanks to uh, Rupert Fusho, Jack Bautista, and Mary Ann Ordonio for assisting this. And of course, salamat sa lahat sa inyo. This is actually, uh, we have a great turnout today. Lots of audiences from different parts of the world. Uh, and cheers, stay safe, and 
have a good day and we we have more speaker series eventually and we will email you on the notice um yeah many is saying their congratulations now Thank maraming you maraming very much. <laughs> again take note of his email address yes thank, thank you so dr boyko also yeah for uh, yeah. i'm yeah. research coordinator for vp college of music yes thank you salamat sa lahat and thank you to all of you who attended this uh, inaugural professorial chair lecture. Thank you. For me, this is my first ever. So thank you very much. Salamat. <laughs>